Welcome to Monarchist Minute. I'm Victor Smith. We have just received, as we go live tonight, breaking news out of Israel. Iran has bombed Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and other population centers in the country. Iran is claiming that this is retaliation for apparent Israeli attacks on, I'm going to assume humanitarian aid sent to Gaza. Is that right? Well, there's a few different things. There was the embassy in Syria. Okay. And Israel supposedly is responsible for sabotaging the Iranian nuclear program. Okay. So, Iran claims, according to their foreign ministry office, Iran claims they're dying and they have warned the United States not to get involved in this, as according to them, this is between Iran and Israel. There is still the question of Israeli bombing of Gaza, that is also a question here, but we must remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is an attack of a sovereign nation against another sovereign nation. As for the U.S. Uh, not getting involved, it's already too late for that, as the U.S. has already openly admitted to shooting down several Iranian drones. So, let's be honest, the U.S. was going to get involved. There was no way the U.S. was not going to take the standing down. What I think is going to be interesting in the next coming days is how the um, Arab nations are going to respond. Because generally... While the Arab nations are sympathetic with the Palestinians, they do not like Iran. So it's going to be interesting to see how the cookie crumbles, I guess you could say. Is actually movement there? I think this is actually well-timed by Iran because of the Israeli attacks on Gaza. They can claim that it is retaliation for the Israeli attacks on Gaza and get the support of the other Arab nations. In and their... I saw right? something else. I don't know how true it is because I haven't seen anything from an official news source about this, but apparently settlers and Israeli militias are also making moves in the West Bank. Oh my. Yeah, it so... Uh... It's starting to look like another Yom Kippur level mess going on here. And remember, during the Yom Kippur War, it was a quick one and it did not escalate to World War III. However, with Iran having a nuclear program, I do not know if they are going to use their nuclear capabilities, assuming they have them. And well, if so, where they would do it? Would they do it in Jerusalem? Or would they do it in the United States somewhere as a retaliatory measure? Well, as someone who is relatively a, I wouldn't say a fan, but I follow nuclear programs closely because I'm a huge um what's the word I'm looking for um I'm fascinated by them uh the Iranian nuclear program is relatively young it started back during the Shah's reign the Shah was the one that originally wanted to push for it but after the um revolution Iran was so um what's the word I'm looking for heavily sanctioned and heavily um ostracized from the international community that had basically stagnated their nuclear program. Now, during the Obama administration, such restrictions were pulled back because the belief was that they were going to use it for civilian power. 
Obviously, they weren't. Anyone with half a brain could have seen that. But the Obama administration still did it anyway. And so they finally got the um, opening to build their nuclear program. Now, the Israelis, on the other hand, built theirs in secret way back in the height of the Cold War. And I've been sitting comfortably on at least 100 warheads. So, if it now, does go nuclear, it's going to be pretty one-sided. It could be, but would Iran... But, but the main question is, and will remain, would Iran nuke Israel or would they nuke the United States? And would the other powers like Russia and China, who also have nuclear weapons... Join in in the retaliation against Israel by attacking the United States by proxy. Hmm. Well, it, I think it would depend on how fast it happens. Honestly, it would be best case scenario for the rest of the world in the event of nuclear war that it'd be extremely spontaneous. And the reason being because then it catches both the U.S., Russia, and China off guard. And this is better for everyone because that means we don't have time to raise our readiness and get our nukes ready. So if Israel and Iran decide to do the thing and release the nuclear dragon, them doing it quickly actually benefits the world more because once the shock and awe is gone, thinking heads will prevail rather than a slow escalation that might see more and more people get involved. Now, we also have to take into account that the Iranian people do not particularly like their government right now. And some of them actually want the restoration of the Shah over there. And if this conflict... One of the unintended consequences of this conflict could be the restoration of the Shah. That would require uh, whoever, that would require Israel or perhaps an Israeli US coalition to be so successful in the conflict that we can force regime change. Which, even well, though. The Iranian, Iran it's, not like the, it's not like the Iranian government is popular with their people anyway. Right, 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 right. But in order to get that, we'd have to get into the country and deal with any counterinsurgencies that would back the Islamic Republic. It's not that the Iranian government isn't popular. It's that it's still popular enough and has enough control over the institutions that removing it would be extremely difficult, even if the civilian population were to do it. Yeah, it's it, yeah. This is going to be a huge political quagmire for the world, and of course, Israel has been a political quagmire for the world since I would argue the sykes Pico Agreement and Balfour Declaration over a hundred years ago. But that's a topic for another day. Yeah, and you know, I've talked about this. I've thought about this issue before, and, you know, the problem is, is that there's no good, and there was no good solution, and there remains no good solution. Unfortunately, given the historical record of oppression against Jewish people and Jewish minorities, there is an extremely good historical precedent to show why having a Jewish state is a good idea. The problem is, that there is no real habitable land on Earth that isn't already occupied by someone else. So in order to make a Jewish state, or to make any new state for any nation, you're going to have to inevitably displace someone else. Right, and which is which is why... Which is why something like promising a Jewish state was always going to be incredibly difficult. I think Not the a... best, I think the, I think the, if you, Now the biggest if you, thing, go ahead. 
Go ahead. Now, the biggest okay. thing I always um get on Britain about in regards to like Sykes Pico and the Balfour, I can't. Whatever the agreement was, is not that they did it necessarily. As much as as soon as they could shirk the responsibility of dealing with the consequences of it onto somebody else, they did. And of course, if you are going to put a Jewish state anywhere, the best possible scenario for a Jewish state would be to place it in a part of the world that is already very heavily populated by Jews so that you don't displace anyone, but where is that? Well, before, um, I'm talking you know, about before the founding of the state of Israel in 1948. Well, before Germany, um, you know, had its moment and went with the Austrian colonel and murdered 12 million people, there was a very large Jewish population in Poland. Granted, I don't think the Poles would be willing to give up land to make an Austrian Kazi state in Poland, but... Right, and... And, of course, as long as... I mean... Knowing what we, of course, of course, if we were to believe some of these theories regarding certain events that I will not elaborate on, there would have been a lot of money to pay off Poland to give up some of that land. But they didn't, but... For some reason, they decided that carving out a bit of Poland wasn't enough. They had to receive the historic land of biblical Israel. Well, I really do feel bad for Poland because they, um, historically, the Poles have always had very good relationships with the Jewish people. And, you know, it, the Holocaust is as much a tragedy for them as it is for everyone because it was... You know, they weren't just Jews. Those Jews were also Polish citizens. They were members of their community, and the slaughter of them yeah. is... Yes, and it wasn't just... And it was... The, the vast majority of them were Jews. Let's not miss the boat here. But it wasn't just Jews that were killed in the Holocaust by the Germans. It was Catholics, gays, uh, the Romani people... Uh, more commonly referred to as gypsies. Uh, the disabled. It was a whole host of people that were killed very indiscriminately by the Germans. Yeah, but um, in a moment here, I want to talk about Palestine. But first, I'm going to welcome Frederick V up on stage. Hi, Frederick. How are you today? I've been doing good. I'm doing good. Here, lovely to hear. Um, how, so much I see, you, how much have you so talked about? I see you're talking about uh, the Holocaust. Yeah, we're generally, we, prior to you um, arriving, we were talking about the Balfour Declaration and basically all the things that led up to the formation of the Israeli state. Because we're talking mainly about the Middle East this week, considering the... Um, current um, escalation and conflict between Iran and Israel. Of course, oh, we yeah. just received some breaking news. There is footage available showing Iranian missiles making direct impact on the ground. If you can, please post those in the text chat, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because this would be the first I've seen it. Um. So, um, Frederick, um, what are, do you have any thoughts on the whole situation currently going on in the Middle East? Uh, I haven't been really following up on the Middle East. I've been mostly figuring out on other stuff, but yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. But, um, but, um, Iran is definitely escalating the conflict further. 
Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that Iran's been looking for an excuse for a long time, and they finally got on. Wow, yeah. those are some. Those are some very decent sized missiles too. Yeah. Where's the Iron Dome? Because you the, the Iron, Iron Dome, Dome is fun. The Iron Dome is a little less functional than it could be because the president had Israel give up some of their artillery weapons to Ukraine in the Russo-Ukrainian conflict. Well, I guess solidarity is a good thing in this time between Western or Western adjacent countries. I don't know what exactly the rule is considered the weirdest, Western. The weirdest thing about this whole European yeah. power, but it's more so culturally Western than it is um, Middle Eastern. Yeah, the weirdest thing about this whole Hamas uh, Israel conflict, um, it's pretty weird at the beginning because they were Israel was informed that Hamas was going to attack. And it's kind of weird that um, you know, they had the best intelligence, but you know, yeah, they still couldn't prevent. Yeah, a lot it's of Israelis weird. are not happy about that. Apparently, at least what I've heard from Israelis, and I've had conversations with Israelis about this on some places online. Apparently Netanyahu got cocky and complacent and basically just ignored Hamas, thinking that they were a paper tiger. Which, clearly, as we saw on October 7th last year, that was anything but the case. Yeah, sadly. And even, and even then, and even then, the, um, even then, the uh, Gaza, Hamas, even then, Hamas, uh, is cl is claiming it's defensive because of alleged Israeli bombing against Palestinians. Yeah. Well, if Hamas didn't hide themselves among the civilians, use um civilian infrastructure as military bases, and then also repurpose the water lines that get sent to them to supply the city with fresh water to make their missiles, maybe mm -hmm. Israel wouldn't. I'm down. And, you know, I do have some sympathies with Palestine. I'll be the one to admit it. You know, it's not their fault that foreign powers basically said, okay, there's going to be a Jewish state here now. It's really not their fault. They were dealt a bad hand, and I do think the Palestinians have the right to protest and resist Israeli expansion into what little land they have left for their own sake. However, however, and I'm going to use an, I don't know, yeah. an allegory for this. Back during the Civil Rights Movement, we had people like uh, MLK, Malcolm X, and they all fought for the civil rights of African Americans. Never once did you ever see either of those men show up at a Klan rally and start throwing rocks at the KKK, though. What I'm saying is, is that while I sympathize with Palestine, they are idiots for trying to pick an open fight with a nation that's literally backed by half the developed world, including basically the final boss of planet Earth that is the United States of America. As much as I want to help Palestine, they're doing this to themselves. And and not only that, the reason their own population is a shield, like they're blending in with the population. Right. And, right. and it's hard to really differentiate from who's the terrorist and who's not. Granted, the Israelis have a decent system and they have protocols worked out for this sort of thing. But the thing about Hamas is they're trying, they're not fighting like a guerrilla war or a shadow war. As we saw on October 7th, they're planning like these well thought out grand offensive strategies. There's no um, asymmetricality yeah. about their warfare. They're trying to fight an open conflict against an actual state government with a functioning military supplied by some of the most powerful countries on earth. 
it's not even just bad planning. It borders on suicidal. I think they might be thinking that they're going to be getting Arab solidarity with the Arab states. Saudi Arabia has a ton of money. I think they might be banking on Saudi Arabia, supporting them financially. We also have to consider that if they are, if they want to go after Big Bad Final Boss of the world, they're going to want to assemble their Avengers, if you will, consisting of the strongest militaries in the world outside of the United States and Israel, of Russia and China, to aid them and assist them in their and what they see as their plight to defend themselves against unjust oppression by Israel. Wow. I'm talking purely about Palestine here. Wow. I'm not and talking about Iran or anything else here. Well, and you well, make a valid point. I understand but that the, the Palestinian people were the ones that elected Hamas as their leaders. So they're going to be the ones that are going to be facing the wrath of Israel because. Mm. Yeah. Well, I would add that if. To follow up on what you were saying, Victor, that um, if Hamas was planning to get other people involved, they had horrific timing. They first thing first, they waited till after Russia had already began their war in Ukraine. Granted, if they were planning it prior to the war in Ukraine, there's a very good chance that they thought the war in Ukraine would have been over by now. So Russia is bogged down. They're not going anywhere. They're not even helping Armenia, which they were already promised to supply defense for and come to the aid of in the event of an attack. And they are currently get at risk of being wiped out by both the Turks and Azerbaijanis. Um, China, honestly, China could care less about the Palestinians. It's more... Well, important. they would only care about the Palestinians in terms of real politique of... If Israel is toppled, that means America's place in the world goes down a peg. Right, but I also feel like the Chinese are realist enough to understand that there's not a realistic world where Palestine beats Israel in a fair fight. Or even an unfair fight. Now, and this is also the case in, that we're seeing in the rest of the air world. You see... The rest of the, and this is also the reason why the rest of the Arab world isn't letting in the Palestinian refugees, is that every time something happens in Palestine, it hurts the surrounding countries. Like this, I saw an interesting, um, what's, what's it called? A pictograph, um, you know, one of those videos where they show you all the different graphs and everything like the art pieces. I, I forget what they're called. Infographics. Infographics. Thank you. An interesting infographic that showed that waves of Palestinian immigrants coincide with instability in their neighboring countries. Like, revolution in Egypt coincided with Palestinians migrating into Egypt. Um, the Lebanese Civil War coincided with Palestinians migrating into Lebanon. Issues in Syria, Jordan, they all coincide with large masses of Palestinians migrating into those countries and so that's why um other muslim nations are no longer letting in the palestinians because generally speaking when palestinians come in trouble follow but yeah. i'm not saying there's any specific reason as to why obviously if you have a large group of people it's going moving into a country it's going to cause instability but and the second reason is of course that with large population with um, countries, especially those in the Gulf, becoming more and more aligned with the U.S. because of their business interests. The unfortunate reality is, in order to please the U.S., they have to um, suck up to Israel. And of course, I should probably also make mention there are two groups of Palestinians. There's the Palestinians in Gaza, 
which is what we are necessarily talking about right now. There's also a group living on the West Bank, which I think is a complete, uh, I think is a sort of a distinct group. Do I have that right? Yeah. Well, Hamas is um, the de facto government in the um, Gaza Strip. The West Bank is ruled by the previous, I forget the name of the party, but it's basically what used to be a functioning socialist party. Um, but um, real quick, a former member of the council, Leon, would like to come up on stage. So we are going to invite him up. Oh, yes. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Hi, Leon. How are you? I'm doing okay. Relax over the night. Coming to the end of Tom. So just doing a, getting ready for like finals and all. I think in a certain sense, the Middle East would be more peaceful if they were all Christian, but... Honestly, I wouldn't even say that because um they'd still probably find a reason to fight, even if it was between different factions of Christians, like um the Orthodox and the Miaphysites and maybe even the Storians fighting each other. They'd find another reason, let's be honest. The main issue and the I'm main also issue. I'm also hearing that there's Palestinian Christians that are suffering in this. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they've been attacked by both sides because, you know, they're just like an even more ostracized group. They're not Jewish and they're not Palestinian Arab Muslim. They're, you know, Palestinian Arab Christians of both Catholic and Orthodox. Yeah, I believe there was like a missile strike by Israel on to like a Orthodox church a few years ago, I think. Yeah, there I was some just a few months ago. Yeah, that was yeah, that was earlier in the conflict toward the start of this all. And yeah, it's an unfortunate yeah, reality that the millions of civilians are getting caught into what is basically a pointless blood feud because people can't get along. Of course we um so Le Leon, uh what what were you going to say about the Palestinian Authority? Oh no! I was just um, typing that. That's the group that rules in the West Bank, as, okay. a, as like opposed to Gaza. The West Bank Palestinian Authority is much more subservient to the Israelis. Okay, so the okay, so the Palestinians who live in Gaza are the ones that have the issue with Israel. The Palestinians on the West Bank. Do not, but well, well, it's not that they don't, it's that this isn't who we're talking about today. Granted, the Palestinians at the West Bank have their own different laundry list of issues they have with Israel. Absolutely. Uh, they both have the, like, the same issues. I mean, the both Palestinians, as you guys said just a few moments ago, you know, the whole thing of them being pushed out of the land by the Jews. Uh, you know, they both have their own issues, obviously. The difference is that the West Bank Authority do doesn't want, like, an all-out war with the um, Israelis. They want, want to at least have it be more gradual, I guess. Because, I mean, both... Everyone realizes that it's not going to end. The only way this is going to probably end is with the total um, expulsion of the Palestinians. Well, you see, in Gaza, they they did elect Hamas to power so that they Hamas would put up a militant opposition to um, Israeli Jewish settlement. Where in the West Bank, I mean, they're already so squished in between Israel and Jordan, and both sides, both Israel. Not and Jordan, only that, there's also the West Bank. So, and, and not only that, so there's also they really don't want to, like, another war. Though. And, and not only that, there's also Palestinian Christians that are also being pushed out of that land. Again, I, yeah, I mean, it's, the Palestinians are Palestinians. It's, I mean, it does, I, I get it. Obviously, there are religious differences, and the Muslims make the majority. But, I mean, the, 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 both groups are not Jewish Israelis, so they're both being pushed out. Yeah. And, of, of course, we also must uh, make mention here that 
there that this is a developing situation and there are going to be reports coming out after we get finished recording there may or may not be responses by the israeli military to iran or around iran as a result of this there might be more u.s response than has already happened the u.s has already claimed to have intercepted some Iranian drones, I believe. That is correct. And it's going to be interesting if Israel will be able to retaliate because I don't know how the politics is, of that is going to work. Um, are the Jordanians and the Iraqis going to let Israel use their airspace to reach Iran? Or how, I mean, like, how does that work? It's not like the Iranians really gave a, um, gave a thought to Iraqi and Jordanian airspace when they launched the drones. And right, Jordan right, right. has made has already made like a attempts to shoot down the Iranian drones over its airspace. Not necessarily in coordination with the US, the UK, and Israel, but again, because of sovereignty violations. Right, 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 right. I get what you're saying. I know. I'm just saying is, is there going to be some kind of favoritism factor? Like are these it, something I was talking about before you got here was what how are the arab nations around israel going to respond to iran's boldness are they going to side with israel because they hate iran being shia are they going to side with iran because at least iran's muslim or are they just going to sit it out it, it it religion has more, religion and ethnicity has less to do with it than just cold hard real politic um i could you know, none of them necessarily love the other one, love one over the other. But like Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, they recognize that you know it's probably better to support Israel and the U.S. Well, Iraq and Syria have already shown the favoritism towards Iran, though Iraq is a and Syria are both messes as we, as the past two decades have shown. Caused yeah. by us, by the way, at least in Iraq. Yeah, that really is our fault. Although what we did in Syria wasn't much better, but uh, Syria yeah. was more self-inflicted on themselves than we had any role in. Right, but we also <laughs> kind of dumped gas on it too. But that's a story for another time. U.S. foreign policy in the past forty years has just been disastrous. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> let's let's move on to discussing the ramifications here. So, let's assume best case scenario for the United States. Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, etc. all side with the United States and Israel in this particular conflict here. How quickly do you think this ends? And what do you think is the end result of this conflict? And then we can get into the worst case scenario for the United States in that the Arab nations all form up like the Avengers and all team up on this to gang up on Israel. And we can look at the third option of everybody just sits out of it and let this be a conflict between Iran and Israel by themselves, one-on-one, -on -one, or at least as one-on-one -on -one as it can be. Wow. So we have three people here. So let's give the best-case scenario for the United States to Will. Let's give... Arab Avengers scenario to Leon and uh, Frederick, you will get the neutral uh, stance and we will start with the best case scenario for the U.S. and uh, for the U.S. and Will, then we'll go to Leon, then we'll go to Fred. All right, well, I think it's pretty obvious what happens in the best case scenario. If the Israeli... U.S. and the Arab states all decide to gang up on Iran, especially with the Gulf states deciding this is an easy way to get their competitor out. 
the first thing that's going to happen is the Iranian Navy is going to be absolutely obliterated. And there's a very good chance that their ability to ever have influence in the Persian Gulf is going to be mitigated for the foreseeable future. Now, I doubt there will ever be any major boots on the ground in Iran because the Iranian country is very, very mountainous and it would make for an extremely protracted conflict. But I could see of extremely aggressive air campaign taking out strategic targets um economic targets disrupting their oil production and their economy as well as their infrastructure it yeah. won't be fatal to the islamic republic but it would be extremely extremely painful and the one thing that will result in this above anything else more so than israel maintaining its sovereignty more so than Israel enforcing its authority across the planet, will be that the um, U.S. will once again be reminded that, well, not the U.S., the world will once again be reminded that the U.S. is the undisputed master of the Middle East, and that any power that wants to enter the Middle East is there by our consent alone. Now with the oh. Arab Wait, one more final thought. Okay. An extreme disruption from, of Iranian oil production would be disastrous for one nation in particular, and that is China, who sources a lot of their oil and their crude from the Iranians. Iran yeah. is second only to Russia in supplying um, China with its fossil fuels. So there is a very good chance that by cutting the head off Iran and their oil production capabilities, we indirectly hurt China, buying Taiwan more time and, uh, of course, causing economic instability in the Red Giant. All right, and now with the Arab Avengers timeline, here is Leon. Okay, so just to state it publicly, so my relationship with the, all federal government stays intact. This is a purely hypothetical. I yes, and we should, and we should all, we should, or? yes, and we should all make mention here. These are hypothetical scenarios. Go, go we ahead. do not endorse any of these explicitly. Oh, well, at all. But um, okay. So if if the Arab states decided to just backstab the alliances with the U.S. and go in full force with Iran against Israel. What would happen is, of course, not, even, not before even military engagements, Egypt would close down the Suez, Iran, Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia would cut off oil to Europe and the US and whoever else, just the uh, many, especially to blackmail the Europeans because we've already seen how the, they failed with the Russian gas prob crisis. Um... Again, I mean, they, they, we, we've seen it a lot in the past, though, without Iran. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the Arabs try to pull, pull, um, push in all sides of Israel. We would see probably intensification of war crimes, massacres on both sides. So, but I, I really don't see Israel falling here. I mean, they've, they've, protect, they've been able to protect themselves many times in the past. Again, I mean, they might lose some territory. Of course, there'll be many, many deaths. But I don't see them falling in a, a like, Arab, Persian, United Force marching on Jerusalem and, you know, capturing none of the audience. All it would be is an intensification, and I highly doubt at that point if, hypothetically, the entire Islamic Middle East united against Israel, I don't see any U.S. direct U.S. US military involvement all right, and now for the neutral perspective, here is Frederick. Um, first of all, I'm not sure if um they're gonna not. I'm not sure if every um Arab nation is gonna come to Palestine's defense, but you know you have Lebanon and then Yemen, but Yemen ain't gonna. You know, okay, Fred, okay, Fred, the scenario that I gave you was that every all of the Arab nations decide to be neutral in the yeah. conflict and allow Iran and Israel to essentially fight one-on-one -on -one and they don't 
uh, if they don't get involved. Yeah, like, so Ron could get involved, and the others don't really give two craps about them to dishing it out. But but I'm not sure if they're going to, you know, stay neutral, especially since Iran is, you know, sending drones over the Arab nation's, uh, you know, air borders and that kind of stuff. Right. Maybe. But maybe. in all aspects, I don't think they want to get, really get involved. In that kind of thing. Okay, okay. I'm asking you, okay, so I'm asking you to play the scenario out where every Arab nation remains neutral in this conflict between Iran and Israel. How you think the conflict plays out and the ramifications of such a conflict? I think it's possible that, you know. Once Israel gets done with, you know, its operations and um, is Israel, there there might be something that could happen between Israel and Iran since you know Iran has. Well, Israel something and- already happened. Something already yeah. happened. I'm yeah. asking you to. I'm asking you to essentially give me the next steps. For both nations, assuming the other Arab nations don't get involved. So, the the Arab nations don't get involved with the the whole conflict between Iran and Israel. That's probably going to happen. Because there's a lot of, like, sets in the Islamic um, religion that are prominent in a lot of the Middle East, and some of them might not care that um, Iran is attacking Israel. You know, I do have a question. And some that I, and I'll some think about it. might not want to get involved because uh, it could damage them. Uh, if for any of these um, scenarios, are we factoring in non-state actors such as Hamas, Hamas Hezbollah, um, the other various military groups? Are, are we counting those at all? We are for the purposes of for for the purposes of ease of scenario. Are uh, we are not going to factor them in because of. Because of the, because I don't want to make the job harder than it already is. Although it would be interesting to see what the Hoofies do in all this mess. I forgot about the Hoofies, thank you. That's the other H group. Hmm. Okay, well, if if anyone wants to working their side with everybody else involved, the Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, etc. If you want to revise your stuff based off of their involvement, you are free to do so. And because I started with Will the first time, I will start with Will this time. I don't think uh, the in- introduction of non-state actors is going to make more of a difference than it already is, because primarily this conflict is being fought by non-state actors in the first place. Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, etc. But I do think that if Iran jumps, that if the U.S. jumps in on Iran, we can probably see a more aggressive response against the Houthis, more so than we've already seen. All right, Leon? I mean, for all intensive purposes as of right now, I mean, these... the. Three, the three groups we've just mentioned are nothing more than Iranian proxies, even though that relationship does fluctuate at certain times. And it, I, I see it being very awkward. Um, well, not awkward. Um, it just, these, these um, especially, especially since um, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis are in control of, in three very weak countries, that being Palestine, Le- Lebanon, Yemen, they, they would simply just take, take it over. And especially since I'm going off, I have to go off the assumption that Iran and the other Arab states would walk together. 
Okay. So well, I think what we have discovered here is that the non-state actors, this is basically a war between non-state actors. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't ward it like that because Israel okay. and Iran are both states. I, I'm just, right. Israel and Iran are Israel. both states. They're, Iran is receiving help from non-state actors like Hamas and Hezbollah. And the Houthis. To a much, much lesser extent. Yeah. At most, I think Iran is going to be a nuisance in the air for Israel as much as the U.S. air support is a nuisance for Iran and its proxies. Right. I think that is something that everybody can agree on here. Now, I wanted to bring forward a... A, um... Now, I will preface this by saying I do not know how true this is. I cannot verify this information. I cannot verify this information. I do not believe this to be true. But I am hearing reporting that there are alleged, alleged, um... Muslim groups that are crossing our through our Mexican border illegally into the United States using yeah. Me Mexico yeah. to do that. I once again I cannot verify the authenticity of this information. Actually, I think a few months ago um there was there's this guy that came to the border they didn't know who he was, but they let him through. They soon found out later that he was the leader of a terrorist group. Okay, so, assuming that is true, and assuming there are other leaders of terror groups crossing our southern border with members of these organizations, assuming... Does this play into any, should this play into any U.S. response in this conflict? Uh, as a response to the U.S. military, no. As a response to things like the Department of Homeland Security, NHS, and other such organizations, yes. And I think if it really comes to it, this will be a very str huge stress test for those organizations. Just and, you know, I can definitely see people who are um, very critical of these organizations because of their spying on American citizens and violating of our rights will either, for them, this will either make or break these organizations, either the NHS and the DHS are going, not NHS, but, um... DHS. N NHS D is the UK's National Health Service. Right, I meant the, um, what is that other organization? DHS, it's Department of Homeland Security. Right, I remember that. I was, NSA, the DEA? NSA, sorry, my bad. But NSA. I think it, if there are Iranian terror cells that have smuggled themselves into the U.S., it is time for the NSA and DHS to actually prove their work. Oh. Oh, and of course, now, the I, to do the same. Okay, now, Frederick, did this alleged did this alleged source give who these organizations are for, or who these organizations are affiliated with, or is this just a blanket statement about terrorist organizations. Um, it's not sure, but for what I know, they're coming right through the border. Like we, our border is like wide open at this point, and it's it's a recipe for disaster. Oh, okay, I'm gonna say right here. I mean, I don't know who they you are. You guys kind of made the made the um, I don't want to say racist, but kind of the out of the assumption that. The, that this terrorist group 
is is somehow like an Islamic Arab. I mean that 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 was the assumption you guys just took right there, man. With it, I mean we've seen over the border for years. We've seen uh, like when it comes to, like the different criminal organizations from Mexico and Latin America cross the border multiple times a day to move drugs, to move weapons, to commit crime in the U.S. and Mexico. I mean, I mean it's not like the border. It's just like all of a sudden now it's going to become ten times worse than, than it has been. To be completely frank with you, it's not like these organizations need to do anything. Public opinion here is already so divided. Mm. Right, and of course, and of course, the um, terror organization that is cited in this alleged report could be a Mexican drug cartel that it, that is armed to the teeth. Of course, isn't it all of them that's armed to the teeth? I don't know. Those, some of those cartels are very, very well armed for what they do. Like, I remember seeing one video, they had um, APCs, actual APCs, armored patrol cars, and they were all decked out in black tactical yeah, armor, and they had, like, night vision goggles and good kit, and it was incredible. Oh, yeah, it was awesome. more like a SWAT like team a... to me. Oh, yeah, they look like a SWAT team more than they look like a cartel. Well, they look like a like an army. Mm-hmm. Like and a private. Tell you how much money these guys make, either that or military hard cheaper. It, it's scary, man. Ma- of course, imagine- military parts are on the open market in places like Afghanistan, so there is a potential source for military equipment for. Mexican drug cartels, but that's beside the point. The point is that this is a very serious situation going on in Israel right now with Iran and Israel going at I say don't don't worry about like the border being like some sort of cause for like a mass terror attack here in the U.S. as of right now. The institutions like um, um, the NSA and the, DA, the DHS, the, they're like tracking this stuff because they already have intel about these groups across the world. I mean, you know, if there is one here, we'll get to it when it, we'll get to it if and when it happens. Well, we should be more focused now on the immediate war, uh, the war area in itself. Right, and let's be honest, the um, U.S. intelligence community would want to let the public know anyway because ha- there'd be several groups of morons in our country who probably would take it on themselves to hunt them down. No, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This country, we have a history of just, like, ripping the public into, like, this these mobs. I mean, we don't have to look far in the history books of just seeing, like, mob action being taken against a certain group. I firmly believe that a lynch mob isn't just an activity. It's just a natural state when enough Americans get mad about something. Like, it's kind of like um, when piranhas smell blood in the water. That's basically what it is for Americans. Yeah, but also cartels are using immigrants to distract uh, border guards in order to smuggle in their drugs. Well, that's nothing. We've been doing it for a while. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, nothing new aside. It's a whole multifaceted complex situation. Uh, border guards on the border in order to make this not happen again. Well, that is a domestic policy issue that is not exactly germane to our current conversation. I apologize for bringing it up. Let's talk instead about, let's talk instead about the, I think we've covered everything that we needed to cover tonight. Yes, sir. Hmm. Well, then, I would like to petition that we talk about for something Fred brought up earlier, that we go over our recap of the eclipse. And I have some wonderful things I would tell, given that I was the path of totality. Okay, um, we'll fire away. Lee, first of all, Leon, you're from Michigan, right? Yeah. 
Was total? Were you in the path of totality too? I don't know how much that went in Michigan. There really wasn't any path of Michigan in the path of it, but we were like right off of it. Uh, so you got so, most of it. In a in a sense, I mean, it's not like it was like pitch black, like it was for obviously um you in Ohio, but I mean, right. we did see for the almost like ninety nine percent of the sun go away. But still, that one percent of sun, you know, it still it keeps everything light for the most part. Right. But, um, it was incredible. Okay, so um, yeah, it's it's one of those rare things that you know. That you got you... totality in um Arkansas, didn't you, Frederick? Yeah, I saw it. Like it was like it. It was kind of like uh, you know, the more you know. When you get up in the morning, like, it's, like, a little bit dark out, but, you know. Right, yeah, I'm sort of uh, somewhere between um, twilight and dawn. Like, it was interesting, like, because you could see the area that wasn't under the path of totality because there was, like, a halo of light in the horizon. And I think the most interesting thing is that everything went silent. Like, the birds, the animals, every nothing knew how to respond to it. And you couldn't see a lot of stars in the night sky because it was still bright enough for the um, stars to be obscured. But you could see Venus and right underneath the sun on the bottom, a little bit to the bottom left, but mainly bottom center. And looked like a red jewel. And at first yeah, I, I saw that too. I thought at first I thought it was just the light reflecting off the sun or just like refraction. But later, when I was watching a recap video, it was pointed out to me that that was Jupiter. So, and it's like, I have never in my knowledge have I think I've ever seen the planet of Jupiter. I thought that was incredible. And it goes to show you how big Jupiter is. It is a huge planet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, in fact, the largest planet in our solar system. Now, the one thing that I thought was difficult about the eclipse was, of course, I wanted to get a picture at the moment because it was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. And getting a picture of the eclipse on a cell phone is hard. Yeah, I have the same problem, too. Like, my, like I have to max out the zoom on my camera because um, it kept picking up the glare, even though with the naked eye, the ring around the sun, the diamond ring, doesn't look that much. The camera is just so much more sensitive that it picks up so much more glare off of it. So you have to zoom in all the way even for it to notice the moon. It's awful, honestly. Anyway, let's... Uh, I did not see the eclipse. I did not go out for it. I didn't get the eclipse glasses. I didn't... And, and also, guess what happened? I was so my whole town that was so they bought like two weeks of food and a lot of them were going to use it as like for vendors and stuff oh for so like people to watch it town did panic buy and buy all the food and stuff but sadly there were barely any people to come and now there people bought a whole bunch of stuff nothing well, hopefully, food is unperishable. I hope I would hate for it to go to waste. I didn't see a lot of tourists either, but I knew the bigger cities in Ohio got hammered. But and you know, it was almost sad. The forecast originally was depicting over what, not depicting, but um, predicting overcast. So there's a very good chance that we weren't even actually going to get to see the eclipse because it was going to be blocked out. And spare a thought for people in San Antonio who were ready to see it, but there was cloud cover, so they couldn't. Anyway, this, the eclipse, this solar eclipse, if I may get on a soapbox, things like these, total solar eclipses, total lunar eclipses, they show just how wonderful the universe is and yeah. how everything was 
whether you believe in a Big Bang or not, I personally believe in the Big Bang, whatever the prevailing theory is right now. The, um, how else could everything line up so perfectly for a total solar eclipse to look this good if not for the providence of Almighty God? Mm -hmm. And... I think that leads us perfectly in to getting ready for our closing prayer. If you're done, Victor, finish getting on the soapbox. All right, I will maintain the soapbox for just a minute by saying if you would like to follow us on social media, you can do so with the links in the description. If you would like to join us live on Discord, you can do so Saturday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll have a Discord server link to that also in the description. And now you may do evening prayer. All right. Okay, sorry, closing prayer. Oh, yeah. All right, gentlemen, please bow your heads in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonders you've put in the heavens, for the amazing show we saw Monday of the glory of your creation in the form of the solar eclipse. But Lord, our planet is in pain. The people of Earth are suffering. War and conflict spills across the planet again, and the blood of the innocent is being shed because of hate. Soften the hearts of those in the Middle East and help them to find peace. Help them to lay down their arms for the sake of humanity. And may the Holy Land no longer run with the blood of the innocent and of the faithful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All well, right. until next week. May God bless you and may God bless the United States of America.